dozen times extraterrestrials are depicted as malevolent beings whose purpose is to enslave, experiment upon, and even exterminate mankind. It is a trope of a great many films and books that they are horrifying monsters with bulging, bug-like eyes and long, gangly limbs whose appearance seems entirely crafted to inspire terror. And yet, this is not always the case. Sometimes an alien encounter is bizarre, uncanny and very different from what you might expect. Perhaps the best example of this dates to 1970s England and a young girl named Faye who, along with her friend, met a seven foot tall being with no neck, triangular markings for eyes, paper white cheeks and a fringe of red hair. A supposed extraterrestrial that afterwards became known as Sam the Sandown Clown. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. Before we discuss this case any further, if you could please allow a brief interlude and allow me to thank the sponsor of this video, Established Titles. Established Titles is a fun and novel way to enable you to call yourself Lord or Lady, all while preserving the natural woodlands of Scotland and helping global reforestation efforts. Based on a historic custom whereby Scottish landowners are referred to as lairds or lords and ladies, Established Titles title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland. Formalised by an official certificate bearing a crest, each title comes with a unique plot number which allows you to identify the exact location of your land. Such declares you, in perpetuity, to be known by the style and title of Lord or Lady, meaning you could officially change your name to Lord or Lady and thus restyle yourself on plane tickets, credit cards and even dating profiles. Best of all, however, is Established Title's dedication to environmental stewardship. By working with the global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future, Established Titles plants a tree with every order. These marvellously eccentric souvenir title packs also make wonderful gifts, most especially at the last minute. With their couples packs, you can gift adjoining plots of land to the special couple in your life, whether that be parents proud of their Scottish heritage or indeed yourself and your partner. And even better, Established Titles has told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot. So, depending upon how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build our own wondrously peculiar paranormal scholar kingdom together in the midst of Scotland. At the moment, Established Titles is running a suitably grand Black Friday sale, plus if you use the code Paranormal Scholar, you will get an additional 10% off. Simply go to EstablishedTitles.com forward slash Paranormal Scholar to get your gifts and bolster conservation efforts in a unique and memorable way. Thank you for listening and thus helping to support my channel. Now, on with the video. In the 1970s, the British UFO Research Association, a reputable and still active organisation dedicated to the scientific investigation of UFO phenomena, published a feature article about a strange extraterrestrial encounter. The incident is said to have occurred on a May afternoon in 1973, at around 4pm on the Isle of Wight, a large and populous island located just off the southern coast of England. Two children, a boy and a girl both seven years of age, were playing somewhere around Lake Common, near the town of Sandown, when they heard a weird wailing noise similar to that of an ambulance siren. Drawn to it, the children followed it through a hedge, across a golf course, and into a swampy meadow adjacent to the little used Sandown Airport. Once in the meadow, however, the sound simply ceased. Curiosity unsated, the children are said to have kept going, and as they walked along a wooden footbridge, witnessed something both bizarre and frightening. A blue gloved hand appeared from under the bridge, and with it, a peculiar being. The two children stood aghast as they watched the being fumble with what looked like a book, until it dropped into the water. It then put its hands, which were described as having only three fingers, into the water so as to retrieve the item. 
Reunited with the book object, the odd entity then supposedly went on to enter a small UFO, something described as looking like a metallic hut. This craft, if it can be called such, subsequently moved along in a strange hopping motion, awkward and abnormal and thoroughly lacking the usual deft grace associated with other flying saucer sightings. Feeling confused by what they had witnessed, the children walked away. Soon after, however, the being is said to have reappeared, this time carrying what has been described as a black knobbed microphone with a white flex attached. The wailing sound returned, very much louder than it had been before, and so scared, the boy began to run away. As soon as he did, it is said that the noise ceased, with the being speaking into the microphone. Allegedly, it said, hello, are you still there? As loud and clear as if it were standing right next to them. And so, it is at this point in the story that an already peculiar encounter becomes all the more peculiar still, for far from being sinister or off-putting, the being's voice was friendly, so friendly, in fact, that the children felt safe enough to approach the oddly attired person. Once at its side, they were able to regard the being better. In the Bufora report, it is described as having been nearly seven feet tall, with no neck, for his head appeared to be wedged straight onto his shoulders. It was eccentrically dressed, in white trousers and a yellow pointed hat, which interlocked with a red collar of a green tunic. Fixed atop the hat was a round black knob, and on either side was strange wooden looking antenna. And its outfit was the least of its oddities, for on its face were triangular markings for eyes, a brown square of a nose, and motionless yellow lips. It also had paper white cheeks, and a fringe of red hair which fell onto its forehead. It appeared, in short, to be some sort of strange sci-fi clown. Frozen somewhere between fear and fascination, the children watched as the being wrote in a notebook. With its strange three-fingered hand, it pointed to the words. They were not in sequence with each other. Slowly, the girl, who was referred to as Faye in the report, pronounced them aloud. Hello, she said, and I am all colours, Sam. And so the entity, whatever it was, had introduced itself to the children. What follows is quite possibly one of the most bizarre and oddly hospitable human-alien interactions ever to have been reported. As the children ventured closer, they are said to have realised that the being could speak without moving their lips, but could not pronounce words very clearly. They asked the children about themselves, and when they felt more comfortable, the pair asked them questions back. Fascinated, they supposedly began to probe the being to find out what they were. When asked if they were human, they chuckled and said no, and so the children asked if they were a ghost, to which they responded cryptically by saying, well, not really, but I am in an odd sort of way. Faye and her friend tried to probe further, asking, what are you then? But they merely said, you know, without any further explanation. Then, peculiarly, in seeming contradiction to their introduction, they told them that they had no name. Apparently, they were not alone either. There were many other bizarre entities like them, with them providing the children with a rough sketch of one of their kind. After a while, the being confided in the children that they were afraid of people hurting them, most especially as, if attacked, they would not fight back. Thus, having proven its pacifist and friendly nature to the children, the being invited Faye and her friend into their hut. To get inside of it, they supposedly had to crawl through a flap. Once through it, however, a two-storied building was revealed. The lower floor was spacious, with simple wooden furniture and blue-green wallpaper with dials printed onto it in a pattern. The upstairs did not have much space, with the floor being described as metallic. Once inside the hut, the strange being is said to have removed their hat so as to reveal round, white ears and sparse brown hair. Still friendly, they then went on to converse amicably, telling the children about how they had a camp which they could go to whilst foraging, and how they had to clean the water before being able to drink it. 
Most bizarrely, during this interaction, the being is alleged to have placed a berry into its ear, then moved their head forward to make it appear in one of their eyes, after which it repeated the process to get it into their mouth. Over half an hour later, the children bid the being goodbye, and excitedly ran into town to tell the first person they met that they had seen a ghost. Undoubtedly, at this point, the story invites incredulity. And certainly, the father of the young girl, Faye, who spoke with investigators under the pseudonym Mr. Y, was of the same opinion. The entire tale was ridiculous and could not possibly be true. And yet, the level of detail in his daughter's story made him stop and think. Not merely that, Mr. Y was struck by how thoroughly unlike a ghost Sam sounded, despite the children being certain that was precisely what the being was. Aliens, spacecraft, or anything extraterrestrial at all were simply not present in their minds. Such things were, however, in the mind of Mr. Y. After all, unbeknownst to his little girl, he had for several years now supposedly witnessed strange phenomena on the Isle of Wight. Phenomena which he couldn't help but think of in relation to All Colours Sam and his metallic hut. According to the report contained within the UFO journal, some three years previous, in October 1970, Mr. Y had witnessed something incredible. As he was driving through a nearby village, he saw a large multi-lit aircraft flying near the River Yar. It was enormous, and yet moved without sound. Luminescent, it was also studded with many lights, each of them looking like a bright red cherry, interspersed with a turquoise and a white light. Its movements, so he later told investigators, were erratic and strange, seemingly aimless as it meandered over hedges, even flying parallel to Mr. Y's car at one point. And so he stopped and got out of his vehicle before signalling at it with his flashlight. Seemingly in response, the object weaved backwards and forwards. After about ten minutes of this behaviour, bewildered though Mr. Y was, he got back into his car and kept on going to his appointment. And the oddness did not end there. A friend of Mr. Y reported seeing the same object playing hide-and-seek amongst the treetops. Weeks passed, and strange happenings continued to occur to Mr. Y, with him noticing single balls of red light following him as though checking on his movements. Other times, the balls of light would stay motionless in the sky above him. Then, on the night of the 1st of March 1972, he is reported to have had an especially frightening encounter around Compton Bay. An unexpected tidal surge drove him onto the cliffside. It was caused, so he claimed and so it seemed, by some form of droning underwater craft. Horrifically, from atop the cliff, he supposedly stood aghast as he stared down at two yellow eyes peering up at him like some form of horrible sea monster. The eyes remained below the surface, like a sort of periscope, until they disappeared with the receding tide. After that, Mr. Y got back in his car, went home, and tried to forget about it, until over a year later, his daughter Faye would have her very own strange experience. Reading the report collated by Bufora, it is not difficult to conclude that Mr. Y was an extremely reticent witness. He chose to use pseudonyms to protect his and his daughter's identity. He never reported any of his strange encounters until his daughter's experience, and even then, there are statements in the report which suggest he did not disclose all the details. On top of this, it took him several years, with the journal dating to 1978, some five years after Faye's experience, to acknowledge the happenings. After all, from what can be inferred by the details contained within the report, the encounter, despite its superficial appearance, may have been subtly traumatic, and perhaps even sinister, for both the children and Mr. Y. Indeed, having listened to the story from both Faye and her friend, elements of it are said to have rang true for Mr. Y. Speaking to the reporter about this, Mr. Y explained how his daughter had told him that while they were talking to this ghost, two workmen nearby were repairing a post. They paid no attention to the weird charade as though they could not see it. 
The reason for this, Mr. Y speculated, may have been because Faye and her friend were somehow taken into a bubble of alien reality created by this strange personage. One cannot help but wonder if such an imaginative conclusion was not coloured by experience. In other words, was Mr. Y himself taken into a bubble of alien reality at some point during his own experiences, with him now fearing that his daughter had been taken just the same? Certainly, alien abductions, if this is what this was, are often reported as happening within the same family, even being carried on generation after generation. A sinister thought, for sure, but not one which is incompatible with what self-professed alien abductees have said about their own experiences, and specifically, the ability of extraterrestrial beings to manipulate reality through hypnosis and other means. Not merely that, it is quite commonly asserted that abductions start during childhood, so as to acclimatise the abductee to the presence of their otherworldly kidnapper. Considered in this manner, it is not unreasonable to suggest that Sam may have been a clumsily contrived guise that the children were made to see in order for the being to fulfil its otherwise concealed purpose. Another theory is that Sam was some manner of interdimensional being. Since ancient times, there have been tales of fey folk. Fairies, elves, nymphs, and other metaphysical creatures who inhabit an invisible realm which exists alongside ours. In traditional Gaelic folklore, such dimension-hopping beings are referred to as Ishi or She, and are said to live under earthen mounds. Elsewhere in the British Isles, they are known as Piskies, Asre, Shifra, and even the Good Folk. In all cases, these beings are claimed to prefer children to adults, being more tolerant of them and thus much more likely to reveal themselves and interact with them. And so, it might be useful to consider the being which Faye and her friend supposedly encountered through this lens. After all, whilst we might most commonly think of fairy folk as minuscule winged women with delicate features and soft hair, descriptions provided by those who claim to have seen such creatures vary tremendously. Heights range anywhere from a few inches tall to ten feet high, and facial features can be anything from pleasant and fair to distorted and disturbing. Might such a range of appearances allow for all colours, Sam? as certainly the manner in which the being is said to have invited the children into his hut is reminiscent of traditional tales of fairies inviting young guests into their otherwise hidden mounds and burrows, just as the way in which nearby adults, the workmen repairing the post, were allegedly unaware of the being is similar to how fey folk are reportedly able to choose who sees them and who doesn't that Sam was yellow-capped and encountered within the natural landscape of a swampy meadow adds further fuel to this proposition. And even more intriguing is how the young girl involved was given the pseudonym Fay. Was this a not-too-subtle nod to the identity of the very being which she encountered? Another thought-provoking, possibly insightful element in this case is how both children were seven years old when they encountered Sam. From an esoteric perspective, the age of seven is extremely profound, being the mythical age of initiation when children may be magically influenced, either by man or the divine. This, according to various schools of thought, may manifest as a dream or vision, a mysterious accident or illness, or even an encounter with a fantastical creature. Such an experience is thought of as a rite of passage, an intense emotional experience which will somehow influence the child as they progress to adulthood and beyond. Might Sam have been this for Faye and her friend, some manner of preternatural being which appeared at the very right moment to initiate the children, youthful and brimming with intuition and inborn magic, into the unseen world. But, of course, to many, the suggestion that Sam may have been some sort of momentous magical being or fairy is entirely ridiculous. Far better than to stick to extraterrestrials, even if, objectively speaking, one can say there are quite a few similarities between descriptions of them and fairy folk. 
Strangely aliens in mind, one finds that a great multitude of UFO and extraterrestrial sightings were claimed by children in the UK around the same time as Faye's encounter with Sam. In particular, the 1970s is rich with reports from schools. And not merely that, descriptions of such things can be said to be surprisingly similar to those provided by the Sandown children. Often, the allegedly observed crafts did not make any noise. At Edenhurst School in Staffordshire, a member of staff described seeing an object with a circular sausage shape with a sort of round dome on top, changing colours from brilliant white to orange, blue and red. Mr. Y's enormous multicoloured light craft comes to mind. Then, in another school sighting, a nine-year-old Jeremy Passmore described how he saw a person in a silverish green suit. This was at Broadhaven County Primary School in Pembrokeshire, Wales, on Friday the 4th of February 1977. Fourteen children are said to have witnessed a craft from a distance of around 350 yards. It was on the ground, possibly stuck clumsily in some bushes before moving away and vanishing. According to Jeremy, it had a disc at the bottom and a sort of dome on top. Silvery green with a yellow-orange to red light, it stayed on the ground for about 20 minutes before flying away. As for the green-suited figure, one of the children was able to produce a drawing. In many ways, this can be said to be similar to the descriptions of All Colours Sam not least of all because he, too, was said to have been wearing something like a green tunic. Even the UFO Journal, in their coverage of the 1973 Sandown case, highlighted the similarities between Sam and the humanoid seen during what they referred to as the Welsh UFO flap. Thus, we are left with a very peculiar and very unsettling proposition indeed that there was a great deal of interest in children by extraterrestrial beings throughout the 1970s. Certainly, in the report detailing Faye and her friends' interactions with Sam, they were asked many questions by the unknown being, which they, so we are told, happily answered. The report fails to inform us what these questions were, instead focusing on what the children asked in return, thus occluding what intentions Sam may have had in meeting with the children. Of course, there may have been nothing sinister about it, perhaps so used to tales of insidious bedroom prowling grey aliens are we that we have added an ominous spin to an otherwise harmless story. Perhaps Sam was a friendly ghost, as the children supposed, or perhaps they were an alien, but one which was, as they themselves alleged, more fearful of humans than we ought to have been of them. Or perhaps it was simply a case of an overactive imagination a make-believe adventure had by a seven-year-old boy and girl in the sweeping green wilderness. Or perhaps Sam was a fairy, just not the sort that you and I might commonly expect. Interdimensional, purposeful, and quite possibly sinisterly celestial. The devil is in the details, and so without them, we may never know. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing for more of the paranormal. Equally, you might like to sign up to our email newsletter over on paranormalscholar.com to receive notifications of all new content. In the meantime, you are welcome to watch another of my videos as suggested on screen now. Until next time, 